Good morning, Radiant Church. I'd like to welcome those at our North Campus and our Woodland Park Campus. Thank you for being with us today, and let's give them a great big hand. We are in a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans, so if you'd like to turn with me today to Romans chapter 2, we'll begin to get started. This past week, I talked to one of our campus pastors who said he had a person who had been there just two weeks at Radiant Church, and after the message, he came to him and said, does your pastor's messages, are they always so intense and so heavy? <laughs> uh, and he said, well, you've got to understand we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Romans. And the passages he are, he's covering are intense and they're heavy. And a lot of what Paul is saying early on in the book of Romans and at different times in the book of Romans can almost leave you despairing, can almost make you feel dark. And the reason for that is Paul is setting the scene so that we'll be at a place to receive the beautiful, wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to have another section of intense passages today. So let's go to Romans chapter 2. And I want to remind you where we've been and what we've been talking about. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul begins talking about something heavy and intense. And that is the wrath of God. And in verse 18 he says that the wrath of God is revealed to all of those folks who have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. And what he tells us is God's wrath is against those who knew the truth. They knew there was a God. They knew there had to be some God who created all of this. But instead of seeking God, they suppressed that truth and unrighteousness. And because of that, their hearts became darkened. And they became fools. And they entered into all kinds of ungodly and unrighteous activity. They got involved in immoral sexual behavior and even unnatural sexual behavior. And then a whole multitude of sins came out of that. And then he comes to Romans chapter 2. And he says, those of you that looked at those in Romans chapter 1 and said, that's disgusting, they're inexcusable. He said, I want to let you know you're inexcusable, oh man, if you judge another. Because you're not the judge. There's only one judge, and that's Almighty God. And he goes on to explain to them that they, too, need the gospel. And last week, he talked to the moral man, and that their morality was not good enough, that that was not what it was going to take to redeem them. And so then he comes to speak to the religious man. Now, particularly, he's going to be talking to the religious Jew. Now, here's something that I know, that there's not a lot of Jewish people in our audience today. There's less than 2% of the population in Colorado Springs. In fact, 2% of the population in the state of Colorado who are actually Jews by ethnicity. But what we do have in Colorado are a lot of religious people, church people, people who are trusting in their religion. So those are the people that... Paul is speaking to today that I think we can think of in our own mind. And it doesn't matter what your religion is. It could be that you're Muslim, or it could be that you're Buddhist, or it could be that you're Jewish, or that you're part of apostate Christianity. But whatever it is, if you're depending on that religion, Paul is going to explain the problem with dead religion. And it's so important that we understand this. Now, there is a true religion. There is pure religion, as James speaks about. But Paul here is speaking of a dead religion. Anything we try to find our meaning and our purpose and our right relationship with the divine in. And Paul can totally understand this. Because that's who Paul was. He was this religious Jew he's speaking to. And in chapter 2, he's speaking in a diatribe form. In other words, he has this person who he's speaking to. And really, it was who Paul was. He was a religionist. He was a Jewish man who was very committed to his Jewish religion. And so, Paul is getting ready to dismantle all of this man's false security. So I'm going to point out to you three important truths from this passage today. And the first one is this. Religious claims can be empty. Look at verses 17 and 18. Paul says, indeed, you are called a Jew. 
and rest on the law and made your boast in God and know his will and approve things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. Now notice he said you were called a Jew. Now someone can call you something that you're not. They can call you something. Now Paul is not denying ethnic or biological realities here. But what he's going to be pointing out is something that he carries throughout the book of Romans, and that is there is a natural Jew, but there's also a spiritual Jew. There are those who are called Jews, but then there's a true Jew. And he's going to bring that out by the end of this chapter. And he's telling them that they are people who have claimed the name of Jew. And Jew was, in that day, something that they would consider quite significant. Because it came from the tribe of Judah. Now, if you remember uh, your Bible history, when um, God's people rebelled against him, there were at that time two different parts to Israel. There were the northern tribes, and then there was the southern tribe. And first of all, the Assyrians come in, and they bring great destruction on the northern kingdom, and they are deported, and they are sent out all over the world. And that is what many people call the ten lost tribes of Israel. The reality is they weren't truly lost, but that's the idea behind it. And then there was in the south, little tiny Judah, and really Benjamin as well. They were down in the south, and they eventually were invaded by Nineveh, uh, by uh, Babylon, rather, and by Nebuchadnezzar. And they were deported back to Babylon. While they were in Babylon, the land rested. And there were just a number of Jewish people still living in that land. Eventually, through a series of uh, events, both Nehemiah and Ezra brought them back to the promised land. So they're back in their land. They are Jewish people back in their land. And that word, Jew comes from the name of one of the tribes of Israel, which was Judah, where King David came from. And if you remember, old man Jacob called them the lion of the tribe of Judah. They were going to be the kingly tribe. And so they hung that name on themselves as Jews. We're Jews. We're God's chosen people. We are God's elect people. We are God's special people. And the name Judah itself means to be praised. But the idea they had was not to praise God, but we should be praised because we're Jews, because we are God's special people. And they say here, we have the law. We have the law. And God's law was a wonderful thing. And when they speak of law here, I don't want you to just think of Torah or Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Here in saying law, they're actually speaking of the entire Old Testament. And they're saying, we have the Old Testament scripture. God has revealed to us what nobody else knows. He's given us his law. And so instead of seeing this as a great privilege that humbled them, this actually made them proud. We are unique people. We are special people because we have the law of God. And the idea was God is even obligated to us because we have the law. Look at verse 19 because here... He's going to share what their mission was, what they felt they were called to do in the earth. And are confident that you yourselves are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. Now, in Isaiah chapter 42, the prophet talks about the servant of the Lord. We know that that is the Messiah that was to come. And it said of this Messiah that he is going to open the eyes of the blind and he is going to be a light to the Gentiles. Well, so many of the Jewish people saw that as their calling. That the pagan nations, the Gentiles, they were in darkness, but we were called to come and bring them the light of God's law. Now that's a wonderful thought, but if that was their calling, they failed in that calling. But before we look down on them, I want to remind you what Jesus said about you and I that are followers of Christ. He said, you are the light of the world. So that's our calling. We're to go and we're to bring light into the darkness. And the question is, are we doing what we're called to do? Are we bringing light into the darkness? Look at verse 20. First part of the verse says, an instructor of the foolish and a teacher of babes. Well, in Exodus 19, 6, God had told Israel that they were a holy nation and a holy priesthood. Now, what does a priest do? 
Well, a priest in Israel, one of their responsibilities was to teach people the law of God. So as a nation, they said, that's our calling. We're to go out and we're to instruct the Gentile nations in the law of God. And if they simply will accept the law of God, if they'll receive the law of God, then they'll be in a right relationship with God. And they will be rescued. We'll rescue the world by instructing them in the law of God. What's interesting, they couldn't rescue themselves. But they said, we've got to go and rescue them with the law of God. Verse 20 goes on, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Now when I read that, I couldn't help but think of 2 Timothy, where Paul says that they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power. And that's the reality of these people. They had the form. I mean, they knew they were the covenant people of God. They knew they were Jews, and they had the law of God. But though they had the law of God, they weren't living out the law of God. And their religion had become powerless. So what we've seen is that religious claims can be empty. But I want you to see a second thing. Religious hypocrisy is common. Now, we're all familiar with that word hypocrisy or hypocrite. Do you realize that comes from the Greek acting theater? Do you remember in Greek plays, they would have these faces that you could see? And maybe they would have a big smile on them or a big frown. And they would be behind these giant masks. And so you didn't know what the real person was like behind the mask. Because all you could see was the mask. That's hypocrisy. That you're one thing on the outside and something else on the inside. Jesus called this out in the Pharisees. He said, you scribes, Pharisees, you hypocrites. And he said, you're all pretty and shiny on the outside, but inside you're full of last week's mold. You're all dirty on the inside. You're like whitewashed tombstones that look so pretty on the outside, but inside they're full of dead men's bones. That's a hypocrite. And, and what religion does is it can form hypocrisy around it. And that can become very common. Look at verse 21. As Paul says to them, You therefore who teach another... Do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? So in other words, Paul is saying, are you doing what you're preaching? Are you saying one thing and then living another way? Or like Jesus said in John 13, 17, that you'll be blessed if you do these things that I've told you. Or as James said, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Don't just proclaim it, don't just teach it, don't just profess it, but actually live it. Look at verse 22. Paul goes on, you who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Now they had ways through divorce and other means that many of the even leaders within Judaism were indeed committing adultery. But the reality is, that these were uncommon practices among the Jews. There were only some people committing these sins. And yet, it tarnished the whole Jewish testimony and the whole Jewish witness. I think that happens in the church today. I think that happens with pastors. You know, I know so many wonderful pastors. They just love Jesus, and they're trying to serve him and follow him to the best of their ability. But then there's some who, because of their actions and what they do, they tarnish the reputation of everyone. And that can happen. And that's what's happening here. There's just a minority that are committing these sins, but because they say one thing and then behind the scenes they're committing these sins, it brings a tarnish upon the name of God. And so we read in verse 23, you who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? So they boast in the word of God, but they're not keeping the word of God. They're boasting in the relationship with God, but they're not living unto God. And that can happen in the church today. I remember a number of years ago, I was talking to a teenager who said that she was in a sociology class. And in the sociology class, they started talking about religion. And one of the students stood up and said, I know Christians in this school, people who claim to be Christians, but they don't live any differently than I do. So why should I follow Jesus? That's what Paul is talking about. That the name of God is dishonored because you say one thing, but you live another way. Verse 24. For the name of God 
is blasphemed. Did you hear that? It's blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And then he says, as it's written. So in other words, the name of God is being discredited, it's being dishonored, it's being blasphemed because of their hypocrisy. Because they say one thing, but they do another. So we've seen religious claims are empty, religious hypocrisy is common, and finally, religious, r- religious rituals can lack reality. Religious rituals can lack reality. Look at verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. Now, circumcision was a unique mark of the Jewish people. Every male on the eighth day was supposed to be circumcised. But circumcision was only an outward mark of an inward reality. They had a covenant with God. And the word covenant itself means to cut. And so an incision was made of circumcision that signified these were the covenant people of God. But if there's no real walking in the covenant or living unto God, then what does circumcision mean? It means nothing. It's nothing but an external, but it it is no longer what it was meant to be. They saw it as a rite. They saw it as a ceremony. But they've now taken it to the point where they see it as a sacrament. They see it as making them right with God. In fact, some Jews would say this. Any Jewish man who's circumcised will never see hell. So in other words, it wasn't how they were living or what they were doing. It was the simple act of circumcision that made them right with God. And that can happen in religion. And so the Jewish people were saying something that wasn't actually true. Circumcision was not their ticket to heaven. Circumcision was not what made them right with God. But you know, that can happen today. And I think the greatest example of this is baptism. Now, baptism is a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful symbol. It's an outward symbol of what's happened on on the inside of you. In baptism, you go down into the water and you come up to newness of life. And it means you died in Christ and you've risen to a new beginning. But it's only a sign of what's happened on the inside. So you can go through the ritual, you can go through the ceremony, but if nothing has happened on the inside, it doesn't mean anything. And I think in some places where they teach baptismal regeneration, that that's actually what brings salvation, or even those who teach infant baptism, sometimes they are doing with it the same thing that the Jews were doing with circumcision. So you can even get baptized here at Radiant Church, but if you've had no inner baptism, no inner new birth, it doesn't really mean anything because it's only ceremony. It's only outward. You're really being a hypocrite if you've not been changed on the inside. Look at uh, verse 25, the very end. If you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So this is simply saying that these Jewish people have disqualified themselves from their Jewish status. Because circumcision on the outward isn't enough. There has to be a circumcision of the heart. There has to be an internal covenant walk with God. Verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So Paul is saying something radical here. He's saying there's been a role reversal that has taken place. And he's saying those who were Jews are now treated as Gentiles, and those who were Gentiles are now treated as Jews. Verse 27, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? He's saying, just because you have the law of God, and just because you've been circumcised, it doesn't mean you're going to escape the wrath of God. Look at verse 28. For he is not a Jew, and this is what Paul's been building to, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Now I want you to think about the profound nature of circumcision. One of the things we know about circumcision, it was very intimate. And if you don't know what circumcision is, I'm not going to explain it today. You can, you can do a Google safe search and you can find out about it. But, but just trust me on this. It was a very intimate 
ceremony, affecting a very intimate part of the body. And it was also scary. Now, especially if you were a grown man. In fact, there were some who believed in the God of Israel, and they wanted to follow and be Jewish people in the way they believed and the way they trusted in monotheism, that there's but one God, and they wanted to keep the law in many aspects. But they never stopped, stepped across the line to actually become a Jew. And there are various reasons for that. Many of them were uh, actually cultural. But one of the reasons was they didn't want to submit themselves to circumcision because it was scary. It was scary. Something else about circumcision, because of what it affected, it was a symbol that this is going to affect your future generations. That's what it was telling them. Now look at Paul's next verse, because then it really becomes profound. But he is a Jew. He's saying, here's a true Jew. Here's a spiritual Jew. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. Paul is saying, let's get out of the outward thing because that's just a symbol. What it's supposed to represent is what's happened in the heart. And if you've had the heart experience, then you are actually circumcised in your heart and you are a true Jew whether you're an ethnic Jew and you've been physically circumcised or not. And I want you to think about that circumcision. It's very intimate. It's so intimate. I mean, we have a corporate faith. We are the body of Christ. But the reality is your relationship with Jesus Christ is very intimate. It's very personal. It's very individual in that sense. And I think about Paul's encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had religion. He had form. But then suddenly he had reality. When he was met with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw the person of Jesus, and he committed to that person. It was very personal. It was very real. It was very intimate. Now, I know very few have that kind of dramatic conversion experience, but at some point, we all have to have a dramatic, intimate encounter with Jesus. And if you've not had that, if you've not really experienced him, if you've really not come to know him, I doubt you've had this heart circumcision. I doubt whether you've really been converted because it's so real. You know that something happened, something changed. I didn't just accept a law or a creed or an ordinance or a set of rules. What I accepted was a person. I've entered into a personal relationship. And see, that separates Christianity from every dead religion because you have a relationship with a person. And if you haven't had a relationship with a person, that's what you need to have is an intimate relationship with a person. And notice also, it's scary. <laughs> submitting yourself to Christ is scary because it's not just submitting yourself to a doctrine or a creed, but it's submitting yourself to a person. And it's giving up your own right and your own way to serve him. Paul is going to say in Romans 10, 9, and 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. You confess that Jesus is Lord. You know what that means? He's boss. He's king. He's in charge. He's in control. So I no longer live according to my own desires, my own wants, my own goals. But now I've got to say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? I'm no longer going to go by my own dictates. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to submit to him. And I don't know what his plan is for me. I know what my plans were for me, but now I'm saying I'm submitting all of those to you. Not my will, your will. I want your will. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. That's scary. That's scary. If you've never been scared, if you've never been troubled by the idea of giving over your will and your rights to God, if that has never impacted you in that way, I wonder if you've really been circumcised in the heart. I wonder if you've really experienced this because there's a scary element to it. Also, it affects future generations. When you commit your life to Christ, it is a very private, intimate matter, but it doesn't stay private. It becomes very public. People know something has happened. And if you're part of a family, it begins to affect that family in one way or another. 
If you're a parent, it begins to affect your children. It will affect future generations. And if your faith is not affecting others, if it's not having an impact toward the future, and it doesn't change history in some way, my question is, have you really experienced this at all? Because it's intimate, it's scary, and it impacts generations. That's what Paul is saying here. Look at uh, verse 29. But he is a Jew who's one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and in the letter. That is the final verse of this section. So let me give you a quick summary of chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of Romans. Chapter 1 is telling us nobody is so bad they can't be saved. Chapter 2 is telling us nobody's so good they don't need to be saved. That's it. I, I guess I could have just said that and then closed in prayer. But that's the, first two, that's the first two chapters, which is a hint of what's coming. What's coming is the wonderful grace of God that wrecks us because we who were lost, dead, undone in our trespasses and sins can find salvation, can find justification in God through Jesus Christ. So that's coming in the days ahead. But let's go back to verse 29, the very end of it. It says, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now again, remember what that word Jew means. It comes from the word Judah. The word Judah means praise. And he's playing off that word. Whose praise, if you're a real Jew, your praise is not of men, but it's of God. And that's got to be the focus. You see, because religion is usually all about the praise of men. Jesus really brought this out on the Sermon on the Mount when he got down to motives. And remember what Jesus said? He said, when you pray, don't do it so people will think you're really devout. Pray to your Father which is in heaven. He said, when you give, don't give so that people will think you're really generous. Give to God because you love him and want to honor him and want to further his kingdom. He said, when you fast, don't do it unto men so that men will see how pious you are, but do it unto your Father which is in secret. And then he kept saying, your Father that's in secret, he's going to reward you openly. So, so that is what the praise is about. It's all about God. You see, religion is so often man-focused. A hypocrite is concerned what people think about him. But the true religion, a true Jew, is one whose focus is on God. He lives for God. He lives for his glory. He lives for his purpose. And what Paul is really dividing here is dead religion from a real vital relationship with God. And what dead religion can do is it can inoculate you. You know, inoculations. I, inoculations haven't worked very well for me. I get a flu shot every year, and it seems like every year I get the flu. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> But, but something about an inoculation is this. What they do is they put in your body some of the dead disease so that your body will build up antibodies to attack it. And so if you get some of the dead in you, then the hope is that you'll never get the alive. You'll never get the real thing. And here's what dead religion does. It gives you just enough. It gives you just enough so that you'll never get the real thing. And too many people sitting in pews across this country, sitting in seats across this country in churches today, have never had the real thing because they were inoculated with dead religion. And dead religion will keep you dead, dead, dead. And you'll never be circumcised in your heart. You'll only be externally circumcised. You'll only look good on the outside. But inside, you'll not have the reality. And that's what Paul is bringing out here, that we need the reality. So I keep summarizing what we're talking about, but let me do it one more time. Let me give you one more overview of Romans chapter 2 in these verses 17 to 29. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that the claims of dead religion are invalid. That witnesses of this religion cause blasphemy of God. Their witness does. And that it has no power to save. That's dead religion. That's dead religion. And so listen to me now. Whoever you're following, and this is my fourth point. The fourth point is not one of the three points of the message, but it's an overview of what the message is saying, and this is it. Follow someone whose claims are valid, whose witness is perfect, and whose power is real. And there's only one person who fulfills that. His name is Jesus. 
See, religion makes all kinds of claims, all kinds of claims. But are those claims true? Are those claims real? Jesus made claims. He said he was the son of God. He claimed he was the second member of the Trinity. He claimed he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody came to the Father but through him. Those are the claims he made. And when Jesus died, went into the grave, rose from the dead after three days and three nights, it validated, it vindicated him. It validated that every one of his claims were true. Listen, anybody who makes claims, predicts their death, and predicts that they're going to rise from the dead, then dies, goes into the grave three days, and rises from the dead, you better listen to him. Because his claims are true. His claims are true. Also something about Jesus, his witness was perfect. Do you realize Jesus is the only man who ever lived a completely sinless life? I want you to think about it. Not only did Jesus claim to be the perfect Lamb of God, not only did John the Baptist say he was the perfect Lamb of God, but look at Jesus' own testimony and witness from his life. Look at the Gospels. I dare you to go through the Gospels and find one sin Jesus ever committed. In fact, at one point he comes to his enemies and he says, do you find any fault in me? And they all walked away. They couldn't find one fault in him. In fact, Pilate, the one who's going to have him executed, said, I find no fault in this man. I want you to think about the things Jesus said. Is there a way to say better what Jesus said? There isn't. I want you to find one mistake or one error Jesus met, made where he said, boy, I wish I would have done that differently. You can't find it. His witness is perfect. And he's the only one. He's the only one whose witness is perfect. And finally, I want you to realize he has the power to save. He has the power to save. Peter said this, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Jesus Christ, through the power of his gospel, has the power to save, to heal, and to set the captive free. And he's the only one. He's the only one. So I want you to hear me. You, you've got to watch who you're following. I want you to remind you what Paul said. He said of these Jewish people who he's claiming were hypocrites, who didn't have a true circumcision in the heart, this particular group of people. He says that you yourselves are confident that you are a guide to the blind. Over the years, I've known a number of people who had a visual impairment, and they were blind and they couldn't see. And I've always admired them so much. I've known people who were blind. And I, I just can't imagine a worse impairment where you can't see. You can't visually see. I think that would be far worse than being deaf. That would be horrible to be blind. But these people who are blind can live fairly normal lives. They can do what we do. They, they can read through Braille. I'm, I'm amazed by them. But let me tell you, there's three things a blind person should never do. They should never drive your car. <laughs> they should never fly an airplane. And they should never try to lead other blind people on where to go. Jesus said that. He said, you blind guides, leave them alone. He said this. He said, if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into a ditch. So I think what Paul is asking us here is who are you going to follow? Because there's all kinds of people out there that want you to follow them. There's religious people. There are famous people. There are people with more degrees than a thermometer. And they want you to follow them. So who, who are you going to follow? Who are you following? Because if you're following somebody who says, you know, you really can't believe the Bible. That's an archaic book. Times have changed. T times, times have changed and you can't trust it. You know, there's so many different interpretations of it that you really don't know what it's saying. Let me tell you, that blind guy, is, he's going to lead you right into a ditch. Or they say, you know... I know what I'm talking about. 
I, I know where I'm going. I, I know what, what life's about. And just because somebody can throw a football further than others or dunk a basketball better than others or give a, a brilliant speech sometime or look good on a movie screen or sing music that we like to hear doesn't mean there's somebody you ought to follow. That doesn't mean there's somebody you ought to follow. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation 20, we read that there was a lamb that was slain. But then there's another lamb. And it says that that lamb speaks like a lion. Let me tell you, there's all kinds of blind guides that look like lambs. And they maybe even have clerical collars on. But they'll say, you don't know if, if Jesus is who he said he was. I mean, who's the real Jesus? We, we don't know who Jesus is. And there's many ways that lead to God. And, and let me tell you, if you follow them, you're, you're going to fall into a ditch. You're going to fall into a ditch. Who are you following? Who are you listening to? Because there's only one that went into death, killed death, rose from the dead, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. There's only one who said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, I pray for every one of us today that we would leave behind dead religion. We would leave it behind. And we would come into the reality of a dynamic, intimate, personal, powerful, committed relationship to Jesus Christ. That we would put away dead religion and we would find Jesus. And we would follow Jesus. And I pray for every person under the sound of my voice, whether it be on radio or it be on live streaming or whether it be at one of our campuses, Lord, I pray right now for them that they would pay attention to who they're following. That they wouldn't just follow someone because they have a lot of degrees. They wouldn't follow someone because they seem to be smart or because they're good looking, but they would follow the only one who deserves to be followed. And Lord, we pray that we would not be those who have itching ears and are wanting to search out for those who will simply tell us what we want to hear. Those that will tell us things like you don't need to repent. You, do, you don't need to confess your sins. We won't listen to those. But we'll listen to those who are preaching the true word of God. Because your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. It is not a blind guide. It won't take us down dead end alleys, but it will take us in the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, I ask that for every person at every campus today. In Jesus' name, amen.